Um, good day to everyone, wherever you are around the globe, and especially to our speaker, Professor Sunil Amrith, our moderator, Jonathan Watts, and co-host, Alan Babington-Smith from the Royal Asiatic Society of Beijing, or RASBJ, uh, with whom we have collaborated on um, other events as well, featuring Yale faculty speakers. Welcome to this talk on why does Asia matter for global environmental history and what can Asia teach us, uh, which is co-hosted by RASBJ and Yale Center Beijing. I am Carol Lee Rafferty, Managing Director of Yale Center Beijing, which is Yale University's only university-wide center outside of its US campus. For those of you who might not be familiar with the center, throughout the year we host events like these that convene thought leaders from academia, businesses, politics, arts, and sciences to discuss the most important questions facing our world. Climate change is one of the most pressing challenges that humanity needs to uh, humanity needs to tackle and today's talk cannot be more timely and relevant as delegates from the public and private sector are meeting from around the world in Egypt for COP27. I am especially excited to hear more about climate change from a distinctively Asian and a historical perspective from Yale professor Sunil Amrith, whom we recently had the pleasure of hosting earlier this year when he spoke about his book, Crossing the Bay of Bengal. I am also delighted to welcome our co-host, Alan Babington-Smith from RASBJ, who will give a more thorough introduction on the topic and the moderator. And the Guardian's Jonathan Watts, our moderator, he will introduce our speaker in more detail. In addition, I am thrilled that we have Yale alumni and young leaders from Yale Center Beijing's Smart Talks on Climate Change program joining this talk from around throughout China. Without further ado, let's welcome Alan Babington Smith from RASBJ to provide a more detailed introduction about today's event. Thank you very much. Thank you, Carol. And thank you very much, Yale, for co-hosting this event. I should mention that of the hundred odd people who have registered, it's split almost equally between members of the Royal RASBJ in, in Beijing and elsewhere, uh, uh, branches of RAS in Asia and in London, and Yale. So that's tremendous spread of participants. And thank you all very much for coming along. Um, as Carol said, this is wonderfully topical. You've all been following COP27, but I haven't heard mention what we're gonna be talking about, which, has, which is the key question of, can the world change its focus from looking to sort of transatlantic climate change to what is happening in Asia? Here we are in Asia, we are home to half the world's population, how you define it. And it is just isn't taken as a serious factor or consideration. So we're incredibly lucky to have two real experts talking about it and to add a special flavor to Sunil's tremendous work on the Indian Ocean. It is a happy coincidence that Jonathan Watts, our moderator, is based in the center of Brazil in the rainforest. So if I may quickly introduce him before he introduces Sunil. Um, Jonathan has been a global environmental journalist for as long as anyone can remember, and has written a wonderful book about particularly the environmental impact of China when he was here as, as a journalist called When a Billion Chinese Jump. And now he is based in the middle of the rainforest where with his wife he is producing, amongst other things, a wonderful new newsletter called Suma Uma, which not only deals with the physical disruption of the rainforest, and in passing I might mention that under Bolsonaro, Brazil has lost four billion trees, with a B, billion, four billion trees, but also the life of 
many of the indigenous peoples, particularly the Yanomami near him, is under constant threat. So we just John is, is very much in the middle of this, this hurricane of, of the global environmental disruption. So John, may I leave you please to introduce Sunil? And before you do, can I just mention some house rules as it were for our talks? Uh, first of all, this talk is recorded. Um, second, everyone will be muted except the speakers. And third, questions. We hope we'll have lots of time for questions. Please post them on the chat function addressed to everyone. And Jonathan and I will pick them up and try to make sure that you, we are all answered. And with that, John, over to you, please. Thank you very much indeed, Alan, and thank you, Carol. Um, it's, a, it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, I guess some of the old timers in the audience might remember me from my China days. That was 10 years ago, unbelievably. Um, it was a really important time in my life. Uh, and as well as fond memories, it helped to shape my views about the environment, about the global environment. In fact, it's where I became uh, an environment correspondent. I sort of entered the country as someone interested in football and politics uh, and economics and ended it uh, as, as someone who was totally obsessed with the climate and what was happening to biodiversity. Uh, it's, it was really in China that I started to see the environment not as a separate subject, uh, but as a prism to see everything. Um, as you will all know, generally speaking, newspapers, especially 10 years ago, and certainly a lot now, um, tend to put the environment in its own department. Uh, like in governments, you have the environment minister. Uh, but instead of, I've always argued, well, since I went to China, that instead of making a ghetto uh, for the environment as a separate subject, we should be, it should, it should be a subject that crosses uh, all boundaries uh, political boundaries and boundaries inside newspapers between departments and boundaries between departments inside governments. Um, and so I have China to thank for that and the insights that I gained there, because I really felt that uh, East Asia, but certainly China in particular, um, was the front line. Um, that may have changed and we'll hear from our guest speaker who I'll introduce very shortly uh, about whether you know, maybe India is, is closer now. Just before I introduce uh, Sonil properly, just a, a few numbers just to set perspective. Um, yesterday was the day officially that the world's population hit 8 billion, um, which is a staggering number. I mean, it was uh, a billion, less than a billion at the turn of the century. 50 years ago, it was 3.7 billion. So we've doubled in 50 years. And of course, in that time, we also recently heard uh, that in that 50 years, 70% of the world's wild animals um, have, have been uh, wiped out. That, that doesn't mean made extinct. It just means their populations reduced by 70% as ours more than doubled. And of course, where is human humanity uh, concentrated most in Asia of those 8 billion, I think something like 4.5 billion uh, are, are in Asia, mostly in, in China and India. But the environment is much more than a population question. We, we can discuss that later, of course, um, but it's one of the factors without a doubt. So I'm, um, I haven't been in Asia, as I said, for, for 10 years, at least not for work. Um, and so I will leave the, the expert analysis to uh, our great guest today, uh, Sunil Amrith, who it's my great pleasure to be talking to and to introduce. Uh, Sunil is the uh, Renu and Anand uh, Dawan uh, Professor of History at Yale University. He's chair of the South Asian Studies Council, also of Yale University, and he's an author of uh, several books, all with an environmental theme, at least all the ones that I've seen online. Um, in 2013, he wrote a book about uh, uh, environment and migration, uh, 
a book called Crossing the Bay of Bengal, The Furies of Nature and the Fortunes of Migrants. Um, then uh, a few years ago, he wrote another book called Unruly Waters, uh, which is uh, a focus on environmental history with a very strong, from an Indian, in particular, an Asian more generally perspective uh, that focuses on water and the monsoons and understanding the monsoons and how to control the monsoons. Uh, we will discuss that, I hope, uh, uh, later. Uh, and now he's working on another book, uh, which will be called, I understand, Ruins of Freedom, uh, that uh, should look on an a even broader perspective. Uh, that's my understanding of it. But I will leave the man himself uh, to tell you all about it. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you here today, Sunil. All yours now. Um, thank you so much. Um, Huge thanks to Carol and to Alan for this invitation. I'm really excited to be here. And, and what a pleasure to be in conversation with Jonathan Watts, whose work has shaped my thinking um, and uh, really sort of been pivotal to how I've thought about contemporary environmental problems for, for, for the decade or so since he's been in Beijing, if, if not longer. So um, this is a pleasure. I'll talk for about half an hour, but I'm really looking forward to the part of this where Jonathan and I get to, to talk to each other and also to, to involve all of you. Um, so something that Jonathan just said is really central to my perspective, and that is to see the environment not as a separate subject, but as a prism to see everything. And I can't think of a better way to convey the kind of history that I'm trying to write, which is that environmental history has for a long time, for about 20, 30 years, been a flourishing subfield of history, but always a specialized subfield. And to this day, wherever you are in the world, and I know you're joining us from many places, if you walk into a good bookshop, uh, go to the history section, you won't find a lot of environmental history. Uh, and what you particularly won't find is the environment integrated into general accounts of global history. Um, and this is actually the very first time that I'm previewing a little bit of the new book that I'm currently maybe halfway through writing. I hope my editor's not watching this. Um, I would like to, to share some of the key ideas um, in the book, and I'd love to get all of your thoughts. Amitav Ghosh, uh, in a book he wrote a few years ago called The Great Derangement, this is the Indian novelist and anthropologist Amitav Ghosh, uh, is a, his first nonfiction book on climate change. There's been a more recent one. Um, he started his chapter on history with a very nice encapsulation of why Asia matters for the climate crisis. And there were two answers. One was quite simply the sheer weight of numbers, because it's not just now, but really for the past thousand years or more that Asia has been home to about half of humanity. Um, Asia can't but matter for how human beings have inhabited this planet, um, even before anthropogenic climate change. The second is really in the realm of ideas. Ghosh suggested that Asia is important for how we think about the climate crisis because um, he pinpoints a particular tradition of political thinking in Asia in the 20th century, and he's thinking mostly of India, but perhaps also of China, where there was a powerful strain of thought that resisted or aimed to slow down um, the move to a fully industrial society. And the thinker that uh, Ghosh had primarily in mind is Mahatma Gandhi in India. Um, and we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit. I think my own view is a little bit different. I, I, I'm a little more skeptical of how much anti-industrial sentiment there really has been in 20th century Asia. If anything, I think it's the opposite. Um, I, I think that uh, we'll, we'll come to this, but I think that the legacy of colonialism um, left Asian political leaders and indeed most citizens with an urgent sense of needing to catch up, of needing to speed up, of needing to join the modern world as they saw it. Um, so I agree with Ghosh that actually ideas are very important, but I'm not sure that I put the same emphasis on thinkers like Gandhi, whom I see as really quite idiosyncratic and very influential politically, but actually not that influential economically. Um, that I think has a longer life than I've given it. By the end of the 20th century, Gandhi actually becomes very much an influence on the Indian environmental movement and on environmentalists elsewhere. So perhaps that influence is there, but sort of takes a couple of generations to be felt. Um, but I just wanted to start with Amitav Ghosh because I think it's a very interesting take on why Asia matters. And it's a 
an intervention that I would like to sort of develop and, and think through and perhaps uh, provide a slightly different perspective on uh, in, in conversation. Um, but let me start with a, in the vein of a fairy tale, because once upon a time, all history was environmental history, which is to say that the climate, the weather, the land really determined what human beings could and could not do. This isn't to say that there hasn't over millennia been uh, enormous ingenuity in how human societies have tried to adapt to and use and harness and channel their environments. But until very, very recently in human history, I think the idea that we could achieve freedom from nature would have been absurd. And I think that's the first point I want to make, is how late in human history that idea that we might actually be free from the climate, from the the rest of nature um, was even imaginable. And it was only ever imaginable for a small slice of humanity. For most people who live in the world today, that is still an absurdity. The idea that one might be liberated from the vagaries of the monsoon, if you're talking about South Asia, or of storms, droughts, floods. And perhaps all of us are now starting to see that. But I think there was a period of time from maybe around 1800 to perhaps quite recently when a slice of humanity, the most powerful and privileged slice of humanity, believed that they no longer depended on nature. They believed that science and progress had changed everything and that the human battle against nature, framed in that way as a battle against nature, could be won, would be won, and maybe for the second half of the 20th century people believed it had been won. I'm going to uh, just share a couple of pictures to, to sort of illustrate this point, if that's okay. Um, so this is an ad for carrier air conditioning, 1940s. It's called The Weather Maker. And um, in a whole series of ads that the carrier air conditioning company put out around this um, uh, time. One of them said, cheat the atmospheric whims of mother nature. And in some sense, this was a culmination, this idea that people could control the very weather around them. Uh, we take air conditioning for granted as, as a sort of everyday technology, those of us who are lucky enough to do so. Um, but what an amazing idea, the idea that um, the American consumer initially could control the very atmosphere in which they lived. Um, and this is an idea that, of course, had a very important role in shaping Asia's future. Um, I grew up in Singapore. And towards the end of his life, uh, Lee Kuan Yew, Singapore's first and longest serving prime minister, was asked what he thought was the most important invention of the 20th century. And he didn't hesitate. He said air conditioning is the most important invention of the 20th century. Um, Lee Kuan Yew believed that climate was destiny and that air conditioning had actually changed Singapore's destiny. It changed the nature of civilization, he said, by making development possible in the tropics. And I think that our, over the past 200 years, a great rift has divided those human beings who could insulate themselves against the atmospheric whims of mother nature and those who could never dream of doing so. And I think this existential inequality has in many ways shaped the modern world, and it has certainly shaped the climate crisis. But I want to stay with air conditioning because um, I've called my book The Ruins of Freedom. And the fundamental idea at the root of that is that all of the freedoms that we hold dear, and I'm not talking about party political freedoms, but I mean sort of the fundamental ones, um, freedom to live our lives um, in a certain level of comfort and dignity and security. Those dreams are at risk from the climate crisis, from the environmental crisis, from the lack of biodiversity. Um, it has traditionally been the case that, um, for example, certain people on the left in the West um, don't actually, haven't taken environmental questions that seriously because they're seen as almost an indulgence. Um, that first you deal with the questions of poverty and inequality. Um, and then, yes, perhaps we can deal with these environmental questions. Um, the great literary critic Edward Said, for example, who's shaped um, literary criticism, post-colonial theory, 
was very skeptical and rather dismissive of environmental thinking. This is something Naomi Klein pointed out in an essay she gave the Edward Said lecture a few years ago, and she said, you know, he saw it as a bourgeois indulgence. Um, and I think what's striking is the fact that all of the most humanist freedoms, freedom from uh, racial discrimination, uh, the freedom of gender equality, all of those struggles across different political systems, I think, are imperiled by the state of our planet. Um, and, and that is the key idea. And I want to stay with that as a paradox, um, because in fact, many of the things that brought us to this brink that we currently stare at have been liberatory, have been progressive. Um, yes, there is a story we could tell about the greed of a small number of people leading us here. And I think that's an important story. I think that's not an inaccurate story, but there's also a much more awkward story to be told about um, the realization of a whole lot of human freedoms in the 20th century. Um, and the question is, how dependent have those been upon a carbon intensive economy and upon certain ways of treating nature as, as really sort of separate from human beings or human beings rather as, as completely separate from nature? Um, so those are the kinds of questions I'm playing with. And the first question to me is really what scale of history matters? Because that's another paradox. Jonathan's statistics, I think, made that point very well. Because on the one hand, we're actually aware that the climate crisis is very recent. That is to say that it is really only in the last 30 or 40 years that we have seen a dramatic acceleration of just about every measure of impact that we have, we human beings have on the planet, whether that's indicators of biodiversity, um, carbon emissions, um, I cannot remember the statistic exactly, but a huge proportion of all carbon emissions ever um, have been emitted since the 1980s or 1990s. Um, so on the one hand, it seems to me that the conclusion is, in fact, the history that matters is a very recent history. It's a history that is within the living memory of, of most of us here in this room. And yet, I think at the same time, if we're thinking about the fundamental paths or the many roads that brought us to the climate crisis, um, it's also important to take a much, much longer view. And what I'm trying to do in this book is actually to put those two scales together. That on the one hand, this is a story of um, half a century. This is a story of a very intensive and utterly transformative half century since the 1960s or 1970s. And then at the same time, sort of nesting that, nestling that within you know, a thousand year history which I don't think is in, in the end a paradox. I think that we need to look at both these sort of uh, long durée, very slow moving, um, often cultural shifts in how human beings have thought about themselves as part of or not part of nature, um, and the technological shifts which have happened at a much faster pace, and arguably without the corresponding cultural adaptations and shifts that we now, I think, badly need. Um, I'm often asked what the humanities can offer these conversations about the climate crisis, about the environmental crisis. And I think often that lies not in the realm of solutions. Um, I, I have no solutions to offer uh, those of you who are engineers or climate scientists or policy makers. I think what the humanities has to offer is a focus on capital C culture, on the habits, the values, the dreams, the expectations that human beings pursue, because I think those remain at the heart of the decisions that we make um, that have brought us here and that will determine what sort of ecological future um, we all face. So one of the big questions in my work is, what is the relationship between colonialism, particularly European imperialism, and the global environmental crisis? And I think there are two answers to that. There's a simple answer. And the simple answer is, is that it's pivotal. And that simple answer is also um, true. <laughs> um, there is a sense in which one can see that a particular um, mode of exploitation that had to do with conquest of both people and nature, that had to do with an ideology of endless growth, that had to do with um, a hierarchy of different peoples some of whom could be sacrificed. I think all of those features of global imperialism, beginning with the Iberians and then the British, the Dutch, the French, um, left a profound legacy upon the climate crisis. 
At the same time, I think we need to remember that, as we said, half of all the people in the world have always lived in Asia. That not all of Asia was conquered, that there were different relationships that different parts of Asia had with this project of European global domination, and that that period was in the end a defined historical period that came to an end at some point in the 20th century. So I think the sort of what happened before and what happened after is equally important to think about as a way of contextualizing that period. Um, so in many narratives of global history, of course, 1492 is, is year zero when Christopher Columbus uh, crosses the Atlantic and, and stumbles upon the Americas. There are many other ways we can think about it. Another year I could suggest as a starting point for global history, if we're particularly interested in global environmental history, is the year 1012. Why the year 1012? Well, the year 1012 was the year when um, the Chinese imperial government at that time uh, deliberately distributed champa rice to farmers in the southern provinces on direct orders from the emperor. Hardy and resistant to drought, champa seed doubled the area under rice in China in a very short period of time. I can actually think of few more pivotal transformations in how human beings have inhabited the planet than that. But if we take a very Eurocentric perspective on history and we see that this is, it all begins with Columbus. No, I actually think that not just in environmental terms, but in terms of global history, this fundamental agricultural transformation, which first of all leads to a shift in the balance of China's population towards the South, and second of all, doubles the area under Paddy, um, really shapes what this heartland of human civilization in the world imagines can be possible. It makes a more stable and secure future imaginable in a way that perhaps in many parts of the world it still wasn't, and in many parts of China it wasn't until uh, this moment of, of, of fundamental transformation. You know, rice, I think, changed the environmental history of the world, uh, perhaps more than any other crop. And that's one of the ideas, that's one of the reasons I think it is important to go back in history. And this is a very interesting argue, um, article by a, a largely group of archaeologists called Used Planet, a Global History, suggesting that we need to actually put into perspective um, our modern transformations of the environment in relation to a longer, in this case, about a sort of three, two, three thousand year history of how human beings have actually, if I may put it this way, made the planet habitable for human beings. And that of course often meant making the planet less habitable for other species um, and redistributing um, biodiversity as we now call it um, in very fundamental and significant ways. Um, many of you have visited Angkor Wat. And Angkor was the largest city in the world in around 1300. Um, there were one or two cities in China which are probably about the same size, but yeah, Angkor is one of the largest cities in the world. Archaeologists now believe that sort of seven, eight hundred thousand people lived in Angkor when the population of London was about 10 to 20,000 people. Um, and so much of this is about rice cultivation. We all know that Angkor's triumph and perhaps its eventual failure had to do with, with its ability to engineer its environment. Um, there's amazing aqueducts that you can still see archaeological traces of. Um, and there is increasing evidence that it very familiar infrastructural collapses like dam failures um, had a lot to do with the decline of that extraordinary um, civilization. Um, so in China, we see a fundamental intensification of human habitation. In Cambodia, we see um, a royalist project of infrastructural transformation. India, I think, offers us another uh, configuration which is worth thinking about. Um, India is probably the place in the world where um, a great density of human population, the India's population in around 15, 1600 was, was pretty much the same as China's. India gives us a configuration where that density of human habitation is sustained with much more ecological diversity. And this is a picture from, from um, the um, uh, Chronicle of the Indian Mughal um, Emperor, Emperor Akbar um, of an elephant going into battle. Um, and I, I point to elephants, Jonathan, and I had a quick conversation about this yesterday. Um, uh, you all know that the famous book by Mark Elvin, The Retreat of the Elephants, which is a beautiful, long durée environmental history of China. 
And he uses the elephant almost as an index for how thoroughly human beings had, had engineered the landscape, sort of make it habitable for large concentrations of humanity. The elephants never disappeared in India, at least not until the later 19th century. And I think one of the contrasts in India and China is they're both um, home to comparable concentrations of people, but with very different configurations. Um, political power in India has always been more decentralized. And um, the environmental historian Mahesh Rangarajan actually makes quite an interesting link between political decentralization and ecological diversity. The fact that, in fact, in India, um, pasture and nomadic groups um, are not on the frontiers of the empire, but really all the way through it. Um, so it's it's not a, a core and periphery sort of geography you have in India. Again, until the British really changed things in the middle or late 19th century, what you have is a real patchwork, more like a mosaic, where um, the frontier between settled agriculture and, and more mobile forms of life are distributed all the way down to the southern tip of the peninsula. So, so I think India and China and, and many Southeast Asian societies, Java is another one, are really models of how intensively human beings um, over a much longer period of time predating European imperialism, certainly predating the Industrial Revolution, have managed to intensify their habitation of the earth. And to have done so in a way that I think we can now see as, as relatively frugal. I mean, that is the word that the historian Ken Pomerantz uses, and I like it. Um, these are frugal societies where very little is wasted. Um, that's the extraordinary thing about Chinese rice agriculture over a very long period of time. Um, Francesca Bray wrote an amazing sort of long text about this as part of Joseph Needham's Science and Civilization series. And, and it's we talk a lot about recycling now. Nobody was better at recycling than the Chinese cultivators, rice cultivators, um, you know, in that period after the expansion of, 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 of Champa rice and that sort of integration of, of um, fertilizer and cultivation and silk cultivation. There was an incredible sort of agro economy that was in, in some ways very frugal. Um, so the footprint, if we use a very contemporary term, of this massive expansion in human civilization, human numbers, uh, was relatively modest. And I think that is something worth bearing in mind if we think about what's really new, what shifts fundamentally um, in a later period um, of history. But the first point I want to make is we need to think about rice. We need to think about rice. And there are ways in which uh, rice offers different possibilities for human uh, community than wheat does. And that contrast between rice and wheat is something that sort of historical sociologists have actually thought quite a lot about. Rice agriculture is actually far more productive um, than wheat agriculture. And I think that, um, in, a, in a paradoxical sense, um, spurred certain kinds of innovation in Europe, um, which tended to and ultimately gave Europeans um, for a period of historical time an advantage. Um, but let me jump forward, because we all know where this leads. At the beginning of the 19th century, um, income levels in Western Europe were about level with coastal China, Pomerantz and others estimate, and perhaps twice those of South Asia. By the end of the 19th century, that gap had widened to a factor of 10. Um, this is, of course, Pomerantz's uh, great divergence. And it's a really striking encapsulation of what that transformation meant um, in the British economist John Maynard Keynes's uh, work that he wrote just after the First World War, looking back at, at, at the world that had at that point just fallen apart during the First World War. And Keynes looked back and he said he looked he looked at this world where he's described even a middle class Londoner, he said, and this is just before the First World War, enjoyed conveniences, comforts and amenities beyond the compass of the richest and most powerful monarchs of the whole earth. So Keynes, I think, very perceptively sees that over the course of the 19th century, so really in a century, um, one part of the world, in this case, the middle classes of Britain, um, had so transformed their conditions of living that they enjoyed con conveniences, comforts, amenities beyond the compass of the richest monarchs of other ages. And very interestingly, with a, an environmental twist to it, Keynes wrote that sipping his morning tea in bed, this middle-class Londoner could order the various products of the earth by just picking up the phone. And, and so this is really a, a fundamental transformation in the nature of um, human life on earth. And of course, Keynes is writing this when the slums of London, let alone 
the lives of most people in Asia, Africa, and Latin America um, are not lives of comfort, amenity, or convenience at all. So this is also a moment where fundamental inequality is also shaping the way in which uh, the earth is being transformed. And I think it is that very inequality, that very magnitude of inequality that opened up in the 19th century that then shapes things, um, the trajectory of Asia in the 20th, which is to say, if we think about the political history of Asia in the 20th century, the struggle against imperialism is clearly central. And that's true whether it's we're talking about China, whether we're talking about India, whether we're talking about any part of Southeast Asia. And the struggle against imperialism is uh, partly a struggle for sovereignty and rights, but partly it is a struggle against that level of global inequality where a middle-class Londoner could command all the products of the world, whereas most people in Asia and Africa lived in poverty. And I think the very magnitude of that inequality produced a sense, and this is where I think I have a slightly different view from Amitav Ghosh, I think it produced a sense in Asia that only using the whole range of fossil fuel powered technologies, the technologies that had opened up that rift in the first place, could the newly free countries of Asia ultimately close it? Um, I mean, this explains, for example, why Soviet communism for some time, the dominant rival to uh, Western capitalism, embarked on one of the most environmentally catastrophic of all paths to industrialization. Um, similarly, very few post-colonial states, I think, it's very different if we're talking about um, particularly indigenous groups in post-colonial countries, but very few post-colonial states ever broke from that idea that nature was fundamentally a resource to be exploited. Um, it's no surprise that if we look at the list recently produced of the 20 corporations that are cumulatively most responsible for global warming, responsible between them, just 20 companies for a third of all emissions since the 1960s, the uncomfortable thing is more than half of that list are state-owned oil companies from the global south. Um, we do have um, some of the US and European oil companies that I think are rightly faulted for their climate change denialism, uh, for their misinformation, for their lobbying. But it's a slightly difficult and different equation to take into account that more than half of these companies are state-owned energy corporations, global south often set up with very laudable goals in mind, often set up with precisely that aim of using this wealth to free people from poverty, uh, to catch up so that the world that Keynes described circa 1914 would no longer um, apply. Seen from the vantage point of the post-colonial world, I think the so-called great acceleration, which climate scientists used to describe the sort of sharp uptick in all of the indicators of human anthropogenic um, environmental impact since 1945, for most of the post-colonial world, the great acceleration, the problem with it was it wasn't going fast enough. Um, it, was, it was an aspiration as much as an observation of what needed to happen. Um, I'm going to just say a couple more things, and then I look forward to, to sort of discussing some of these things with, with Jonathan and then with all of you. Um, the first is that already by the 1970s, the most prescient post-colonial leaders already knew that they might have arrived too late to the party. Um, bear in mind that at the very first UN conference on the global environment, um, the Indian Prime Minister Indira Gandhi was actually one of only two heads of state to take it seriously enough to be there. And Indira Gandhi's speech at that uh, was and I think remains pivotal. It was actually the earliest and one of the most eloquent statements of what we now think of as a, the position of environmental justice. And she argued that for the past quarter century, she's talking in the early 1970s, we in India have been engaged in an enterprise unparalleled in human history, I'm quoting Indira Gandhi, which is the provision of basic needs to one sixth of mankind within the span of two generations. She conveyed that sense of urgency, coupled with a fear that India's search for economic freedom was taking place when many of the planet's resources had already been exhausted by others. The riches and labor of the colonized countries played no small part in the industrialization and prosperity of the West, she pointed out. But now, she didn't suggest, therefore, that India didn't need to pay any attention to the environment. I mean, I think this is one of the interesting things about her speech. She said, we do not wish to impoverish the environment any further. In fact, she was one of the first to acknowledge the crisis. And yet her conclusion was, we cannot for a moment forget the grim poverty of large numbers of people. And it ends with that memorable phrase, which we still hear today, isn't poverty the greatest polluter? 
And so I think that this unparalleled quest for social justice, for equality, um, for housing, for security, um, has underpinned the transformation of Asia in the late 20th century. Even today, the per capita consumption of energy, emissions, um, that has enabled that transformation of Asia has been much, much, much smaller than in the United States or in most countries of um, Western Europe, certainly cumulatively over the long term. Um, but nevertheless, I think this is why, um, for me, the question of environmental justice has to be at the heart of this. What does environmental justice mean? And when do we reach the point where the crisis is so grave that we need to think differently about environmental justice, going beyond thinking about historical responsibility and starting to perhaps sort of invoke other registers of what that justice might mean? Justice for whom? Um, which groups of people, in a sense, have throughout this story been excluded from the technologies, from the advances, uh, from the... Uh, domination over the natural world that has also led us to this kind um, of crisis. Um, I'll stop there and, and see where we go in conversation, but we're happy to come back to any, any, any part of this uh, later on, but let me just stop sharing my screen. Thank you, Sunil. That was uh, an incredible tour de force. Um, I, I, I learned a lot and there was a lot where I found myself nodding my head in full agreement. Um, there are a million different potential lines that I could follow up on, but maybe firstly, I, th I think a lot of environmental histories, uh, that I, I, I think you could divide them in two different ways. There's, on one side, they try to explain the past in a different way. Instead of about the great figures of history, they really see sort of history determined by environment. So there's people like the, the Hughes book and Mark Elvin to a degree. I think Hughes said, for example, Alexander the Great set off on his conquests, uh, not because he was a particularly brilliant general, but because um, his land at that time was so degraded uh, that he had to cross the border and he had to be aggressive. Um, and that, you know, this, there's that that sense of how people are driven by 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 their environments rather than vice versa or as well as vice versa and then you have like you mentioned mark elvin and retreat of the elephants which is such an incredible book um but one of the things you know he he explains history uh, in environmental terms many different ways but one of them is that um china and mongolia you know that's that key relationship of the last thousand years well one of many key relationships of the last thousand years and that china generally flourished when the climate was hot and wet because that allowed for an expansion of rice cultivation further north whereas mongolians mongolian culture tend to i would say flourish but they tend to become more uh, more likely to invade when the temperatures became cold and dry because Mongolia became less habitable. And so Mongolians moved south uh, and uh, uh, a lot of the, the worst tensions were during the Little Ice Age. So he kind of looks at this key relationship. So there's that side of environmental history that explains the past um, by connecting it to climatic and, uh, and, and na natural forces. And then I, I think you, you were addressing the other main thread, which is to look back at the past, to see the origins of how we behave today, the cultural and intellectual origins. How do we get into this mess is how I would sort of summarize it. Um, and I've spent, you know, the past 12 years looking at this or more, uh, first in China, looking at the different Chinese lines of thought uh, although, unfortunately, you can see them becoming gradually less uh, environmental, starting with Dongba and, and Taoism, which was very connected to nature, then Confucianism, which is much more about society and hierarchies, but humans, very anthropocentric, then legalism, which is all about building the state and power, and then, of course, Maoism, um, which, is, which, which was a very uh, similar environmental disaster to that that was that was seen in the Soviet Union. 
Um, and yeah, what, what, what we have now, please forgive my dogs. I'm sorry, they're very good guard dogs, uh, but very noisy guard dogs. I've, I've kept the two noisiest ones here with me in the hopes that uh, they won't go out of control, but I can't, I can't manage all of them. So I'll try to talk over them. Please excuse me. Um, yes, yeah, so now, of course, we have Xi Jinping talking about ecological civilization. Um, and yes, I mean, I think it, it's definitely good rhetorically, and there's been some important developments in terms of policy. Um, but yes, I think I think the trend environmentally is is still quite bad outside of China's China's borders. Uh, it's getting better within China's borders. Uh, the, the 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 other thing I would raise before. Some, uh, uh, asking for your comments uh, would be one of the fascinating things about about your your approach is as you said it, the Asia perspective is different from the European perspective. If we read uh, James Lovelock uh, or if we read uh, Alexander Humboldt, I don't know if there's a fantastic new biography of Alexander Humboldt, the invention of nature that's just come out and just just wonderful thinking, but very Eurocentric, of course, and then you're you are quite rightly saying that when you start to look at uh, Asia and, and in particular the the influence of rice culture, um, you look at the world in a different way, and, and maybe it's because of rice culture that Asia does have half more than half the world's population because it it's just more efficient. Um, that that's certainly uh, one thing. Um, and, and it was fascinating to hear your comparison, as we discussed yesterday, about elephants um, and the fact that whereas Mark Elvin describes the retreat of the elephants, the title of the book is because elephants used to be in Beijing, it's hard to imagine now, and there were vast forests that stretched from Beijing all the way down uh, to, to Southern Asia and Southeast Asia. Uh, but these were steadily cleared over time. And when you lost the forests, you lost the elephants and all the, a lot of the other wildlife, of course. And the, 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 the reason, the, the driving force of this was rice cultivation, to, to make space for rice cultivation. That was the main driver for forest clearance. And, and I think I was fascinated that in India, uh, other, there was another model, if you like, that didn't involve quite so much destruction. And my final point would be that, you know, we, this, this event we are having here today is truly global because you're, you're in the United States. Most of our audience, I guess, are, are in China. Uh, I presume there are some in, the, uh, in, in Europe, but, uh, and I'm in the Amazon rainforest. So we really uh, do have this global event, but my perspective has changed since I moved here uh, to Brazil and the, and the rainforest uh, because, I'm, I'm starting to read some of the really good Brazilian archaeologists and anthropologists like Eduardo Neves, who really are transforming the way we think about uh, indigenous culture in South America. It, for, for, for so long, it's been, oh, it was just backward, or the Amazon was uninhabited, uh, and, or very sparsely inhabited. And, and, and this is bunkum. This was just, you know, something we, we heard that was very convenient for us and gave us, to, us as in, I'm so sorry, I sh really shouldn't say that, but I'm British. I wanted to do the colonial uh, uh, mindset that, that I, I hope I'm trying to release myself of, but it's definitely where I come from. It's definitely my cultural background. Um, but in fact, um, when people like Nevis uh, are describing how the Amazon was, was hugely populated uh, and had a thriving civilization that was, um, uh, uh, in terms of sort of life expectancy, uh, was, was right up there with anywhere in the world. And, and that the Amazon, far from being this great wilderness that needs to be tamed, as colonialists inevitably think of it, uh, the Amazon is in fact uh, about 40% anthropogenic 40%. I mean, that, it's an estimate, but Eduardo Levis, he, he looks at like the dark soil, which is evidence of human cultivation. He looks at uh, signs of where, where hum humans live from pots, but mostly he looks at the type of species you get throughout the Amazon rainforest. 
and you find that there is a, a huge disproportion. Di, the, di, it's, there's a disproportionately large share of uh, trees that are useful to humans, fruit trees, medicinal, medicinal trees, trees that are useful for construction. Uh, and these have been planted. So in fact, far from being sort of backward as they were always seen, uh, perhaps noble savages, but certainly not as advanced in technologically as is how they were seen, uh, at, at, especially during the earlier periods of colonization. The, the indigenous communities had, had learned to live with the forest, to be, to be managers of the forest, not just guardians, but like experts on how to live as part of the forest. And then getting to my point, uh, which was, you know, you go back to the origin of ideas, the seed, as you put it, you know, where is the seed? I also like to think of it as a fire, like the world is on fire. And I, I, I always read that firefighters must find the origin of the fire in order to put out the fire. So where was the seed where we went wrong? Um, I'm, you know, I, I clearly Britain had a large part to do with it. Uh, so industrial capitalism, fossil fueled, uh, ca capital driven, uh, in, an industrial model, but also the thinking, going back to what you say about thinking. And it seems that at, at this period there was up until the very early industrialization, uh, philosophy, culture was part of nature. It was very much, we are within nature. Uh, it was very holistic. And then once we hit this industrial period, uh, we started to other nature. We, we, there was a great othering of nature. And this was connected to an enlightenment dualism uh, of, of self and other. Um, which, which allowed, in, in a sense, I mean, it, it, there's a huge discussion there, but essentially it, allowed, it, it justified the maltreatment of the other because you think it's not going to affect you. You're not part of that. It's, it's other colonies, other species, faraway places. And when you start to other things rather than feel part of them, um, it makes you think that you can use them without consequences for yourself. And I think 250 years later, we're starting to see the consequences of that. So for me, this seed or this, this the, the origin source of the fire is there. It's around that period. It's my, my hunch, and it's a hunch rather than anything else, is that up to that point, most cultures in the world had some kind of holistic view of humans as part of nature. And it was only around that point that we really started, we, or at least a part of the world, the, the capitalist, uh, colonialist part of the world really started to almost, yes, see ourselves outside of nature or trying to control nature. And then, yes, trying to even to have a war against nature as Mao and others tried to do in catching up. So I'd be <laughs> really interested to hear um, where you think, where, whether you think there is a, a source of this fire or a, a seed, to put it in a more benign way, uh, or, or is this something that's just sort of grown throughout history and it's etched into our DNA and there's nothing we can do about it? What a wonderful question and what a wonderful way of putting it, Jonathan, as well. Um, isn't that amazing, that archaeological work you're talking about on the Amazon? I, I've, been, I've been following it as best I can and, and it's it's truly remarkable because I think it actually aligns very well with the kinds of work that's been also done on, on various parts of Asia. And, and I suspect what they have in common is really just this idea that it was that piece that I put up, you know, used planet. And it's one of the fundamental um, environmentalist ideas that I think comes out of the North American context, which just doesn't have any resonance outside, as particularly in Asia, and I suspect not in Latin America, is the wilderness idea. I mean, if you think of the history of American environmentalism, so much of that is wedded to this idea of untouched wilderness. Um, and, and of course, what we're finding from a lot of the archaeological work that's being done on indigenous communities around the world, including North America, South America, um, Asia too, is that's just the wrong way to think about it, that these landscapes that we think of as untouched wilderness are actually managed, but 
you know, to use an anachronistic modern term, sustainably managed, managed in ways that sort of allow them to last and last and last and kind of sustain human life. And I think that's remarkable. And I think it does make us think the problem is probably not to, to take the most important and, and sort of hardest of your questions. I don't think the problem is that there is something in human DNA that leads us to want to use the nature around us. Um, there may well be something in human DNA that does that. That, it, that isn't the spark, I don't think, because I think for a very long time that was compatible with the flourishing of many forms of life, including but not exclusively human life. Um, so I think, you know, I think there is a transformation. I think there is a spark. Um, I see it where you see it, which is a sort of maybe late 18th, early 19th century. Um, interestingly enough, the more I think about it, the more I think that Yes, it's about fossil fuels, it's about industrial technology. I think one particular kind of industrial technology is more central than we've perhaps given it credit for, and that's actually industrialized weaponry. I feel like the uh, destructive power that comes out of the Industrial Revolution uh, we know that it's what allows for the domination over the world of, of a relatively small number of European powers, but I don't know that we've thought through what that does to a sense of human exceptionalism. Um, it allows for the destruction, of course, not just of, of one's opponents and of local people, but, but of all, all forms of life. And I mean, if you think about um, uh, the massive, massive expansion in, in um, uh, species loss in hunting that happens sort of very much because of the very same kinds of technologies. And then if you think about the impact of, of, of nuclear weapons in the 20th century and just how fundamentally they give a sense for good and of course for, for ill and in a way that's terrifying that human beings control the planet. They can end life very quickly. And, and so I wonder if there's one, and this is just an idea that I'm working through, that the one particular manifestation of the kind of fossil fueled industrialized technology that has a lot to answer for is I, I think the sort of the destructive technologies, the technologies of killing that sort of came out of it. So that's one. But the other is the paradox. It's actually the technologies of life. I think that the transformation in life expectancy in Europe in the 19th century, which comes often from very, very humble technologies of, of water purification and um, vaccination, it doubles the human lifespan in a very short period of time, as, as then happens in Asia in the 20th century. And I think that too, probably at some deep level, uh, brings an idea of a sort of unshackling from certain kinds of, uh, not the boundaries of mortality, but certainly certain um, levels of interdependency with uh, the air, the water, and everything else around us, just because it, it becomes possible to control these things. And you know, if you think about malaria control with DDT across the global south in 1950s and 60s. I mean, in the end, that fails. But for a while, it seems like totally miraculous. In the 1950s, you know, the, um, if you look at the uh, malaria cases in India in the 1950s, when DDT looked like it was working, it goes down from um, millions of cases a year to tens of thousands. And, and this is a massive expansion. And suddenly, it, it does feel like the conquest of death. It, it feels like the conquest of death and I wonder if it's, you know, it's both of those things. It's the conquest of death and the ability to cause mass death that have fundamentally reshaped how powerful people around the world and, and, and you know, not, not all of humanity have, have thought about human exception as ex exceptionalism. Um, and the only other thing I'd say is I'm very interested in the sort of minority and discrepant traditions. So I don't think this is really a story of European culture versus Asian culture. I think what's interesting is that even in Europe, um, a lot of work by European cultural historians, even just thinking about Britain, um, suggests actually that those kinds of shifts often don't take place in all sectors of society, that there's a, a, a continued, whether it's the fervency of religious belief in 19th century Britain, or whether it is, um, you know, the wonderful work by Keith Thomas and others on, on, you know, magic in early modern Europe, at the very same time that sort of enlightenment dualism is setting in, very large groups of people all over the world that I think live differently, have different worldview, different cosmology and of course that's true all over the world it's definitely true in Asia so one of the things I think history can do is to remind us that dominant traditions are always are never the only ones and dominant ways of seeing the world are never the only ones and I think that remains the case in the world that we live in today.
unmute myself. Um, yes, thank you. I, I see we are actually, we've only got like 15 minutes left. So I, I'll get into the questions really shortly. I just want to ask you one last thing. And maybe you could give me a, a short answer so we've got some time for questions. But when we, when we look at ways we can start to rethink, it's, it's clear that Western science uh, or sort of what started as Western science and now it's global science um, has, has turned the corner and that it, it realizes there are planetary boundaries yeah. and that these need to be responded to and we need to rein back these economic forces. Um, so there's, there's that sort of modern intellectual thought. Then there's, as you say, there are a number of thinkers from the past that we can cite uh, to show that there are different ways of thinking about our relationship with the world, um, uh, the, the Humboldts and the Lovelocks and, and others that we've discussed. Um, I wonder from a sort of, and, and, and we've discussed from the, from the Chinese perspective that Taoism in particular is a rich source of that, that kind of thinking. In India, I just wondered if you could briefly say like a, a couple of, a, a, something about who might give this alternative to the sort of the Modi uh let's catch up and overtake the west doing what the west did and has proved to be wrong um what would be the tradition that an opponents of that would come from is there a, a stream of thought that that, that reformers changes could tap into great question i think there's two or three and i'll make it brief um one of them is the gandhian tradition i think uh whether or not Gandhi himself was very clearly committed to the environment in a way that we would recognize it now, I think the legacy of its ideas have definitely gone in that direction. So by the end of the 20th century, if you think of the Narmada movement in India, one of the largest social movements in global history, actually, um, that was very Gandhian in its inspiration. I think a second thread is is common with with South America, which is indigenous ideas. I mean, the ideas of Adivasi communities in India who have who have increasingly resisted the ways in which they have been um, their lands have been taken away from them, that they have been displaced by say large dam projects, etc. Um, and the third is, I think, profoundly contemporary and modern. It's it's coming from a younger generation. It's uh, an Indian inflected global uh, discourse, which you know everyone from Greta Thunberg to Fridays for the Future. I mean, I think there are manifestations of that just um, determination on the part of young people that wherever the inspiration comes from, that we live in a global crisis and that we need a, a sort of a global, genuinely global um, approach to, to trying to think through them. Yeah, indeed. Yes, maybe nations are also the problem. <laughs> we need a much more global way of thinking. Um, I'm looking at the questions, and by the way, um, please do add questions to the messages. Um, most of the questions that I can see seem to relate to wheat and rice. A lot of interest in, you know, if 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 rice is really better, how comes Europe kind of took off with wheat? Now, I suspect I know the answer to that question, but could you talk a little about the the difference between uh, wheat and rice societies and so why one might advantages over it's, the other. it's a great question something i'm fascinated by and 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 i should credit really this uh oh, the wonderful historian and anthropologist francesca bray for i think the most clear-sighted take on this she wrote a book of 1986 called the rice economies of asia which i think is a masterpiece i think it's an overlooked masterpiece um in which she really kind of spells this out um and the basic issue is that wheat crop you need to keep a lot more back for seed than rice. Rice is in that sense just a lot more efficient. But the other thing, and this may be the reason why in the end, while wheat is less efficient at feeding people, it might have contributed to certain um, technological developments that gave Europe in the end some sort of advantage, is that um, wheat lends itself to both mechanization and economies of scale more so than rice. Um, rice is very labor intensive, which works in Asia. I mean, in a sense, there's a self-reinforcing cycle of rice is labor intensive, it sustains larger populations, it needs larger populations, and there is no advantage, it's a very skilled um, craft rice cultivation, there's no advantage in expanding one's land holdings uh, beyond a certain point, and I think that was just never the case when it comes to Europe and wheat, and you have a very different structure of land ownership, you have these larger states in Europe, which you really don't see to anything like the same extent, certainly in southern China or in India. Um, so, so in a way, you could say that rice is very um, efficient, um, 
but that wheat, the challenges of wheat spur certain kinds of technological innovations. And I'd say the one thing about rice that we are now coming to realize is not so good for the planet is methane. Um, this is something which people are starting to, um, um, scientists are trying to reconstruct. What What is the impact of, of, of massive expansion of rice cultivation in Asia on atmospheric methane? And I think the early results suggested that it was substantial and that there are sort of definite planetary impacts that come from rice, which are, which are quite specific to that. Thank you. Uh, yeah, really interesting, um, about, especially about the mechanization versus labor intensity of the, of the two and how they shaped populations that were shaped by populations. Um, one more quick one. <laughs> Actually, it's nothing but quick. Um, this is the last question here. What is the difference between religion and environment? I mean, that's that's a massive philosophical question, but perhaps I'll get into, maybe, maybe you could talk a little bit about, again, perhaps to re refer to India and whether there are, is sort of that religious side of things that could, could be tapped into, whether it's useful, whether we can solve the environmental crisis just with technology or whether we need to approach it through values, through religion, through education. Um, I'd be, you know, a, a huge it's, a, it's a huge question. For such a short time. Some very different approaches to this. So, you know, on the one hand, there's this classic work um, by Lynn White, the medievalist, going back to the 1960s. And it was actually one of the first big picture attempts. It was called The Origins. It was an essay in science in 1967. It's called The Origins of Our Ecologic Crisis. And his answer is clear. The, the problem is Christianity, that Christianity um, leads to a kind of dualism um, that allows for the conquest of nature. I, I'm very skeptical about such a sort of blanket uh, view, but, but it, that, that's one view, that actually religion is the problem and that the more one sort of secularizes and the more one thinks about um, in scientific and technological terms, uh, perhaps the better a chance one has of, of, of reframing. And then you have completely the opposite point of view, which is that the problem is alienation, is secularization, is our alienation from nature that comes from the dualism that you were talking about, John, from thinking about from nature as, as other. Um, and again, I think as a blanket explanation that that makes no more sense. But what I think we need to do is we need to think about how these different traditions work together. And I don't think they're binary alternatives. You know, uh, let me speak from India. Um, secularization never happens in India, um, really. Um, I, that way, India is quite different from China. Um, you know, maybe, maybe it happens amongst a tiny, tiny slice of the of the Indian middle class. But um, religious ideas are, are fundamental to how people in India have always and continue to this day to see nature, to see the environment. Um, whether this can be harnessed towards ecological ends is a very delicate and I think a difficult thing because at the moment in India, uh, religious nationalism goes hand in glove with accelerated environmental destruction. Um, and, and there is this paradox, which the religious scholar Diana Eck um, has, has pointed out, which is that India's rivers are probably the most sacred in the world in terms of the number of people who, who worship them and genuinely think of them as divine. And they're also the most polluted in the world. And how do we square these things? And can we perhaps harness the fact that they are seen as sacred to encourage a different way of using them? Um, and I think it's an open question. So far, the answer is no, I don't think so. At the moment in India, um, the politics of religious revival have actually gone with uh, together with a, with a negative rather than a positive sort of uh, direction of change in relation to environmental protection. But I think in other places, that's not been the case. If we think about all of the uh, courts around the world, particularly in South America, that have started to recognize the rights of nature, um, th that's often drawing on religious ideas, the idea that that rivers have personhood because in some sense they're also d divine, that they're, they're also worshipped, that they're also important to people. I mean, in India, in an earlier generation, uh, before the current government, the Supreme Court recognized um, sacred groves as places to be protected, actually as part of the constitutional right to freedom of belief. Uh, so, so in fact, uh, showing that because this is important to people's beliefs and cosmologies, therefore these environments need to be protected. So, so I think it can kind of work in many different ways. But the very uh, last question um, uh, from Nikki, I think it was Nikki Gerard, uh, I'll, I'll check back, but it's definitely Nikki, who was saying, what are your views of the two leaders of India and China at present and their ability to balance the you know, immense needs of feeding and raising the living standards of such huge populations with the growing concerns and, and evident 
uh, damage caused by climate change. Um, I think the immensity of the need and the challenges is worth acknowledging, I think, in both cases. Um, I know more about India, and I'm not I'm not heartened by the direction in which environmental protection has been going in India over the last decade or so. I think things have been getting worse rather than better. But I think the way I'd qualify that is if you look at how the leadership of India and China speak about climate change and about environmental issues, whatever their political complexion, I think there has been an honesty in acknowledging these problems, which is totally absent from the United States, for example. I, I think there's a real way in which whatever the government and, and, you know, how much is rhetoric, how much is action is a separate question, probably don't have time to get into that. But there's an acknowledgement on the part of governments of just about any political complexion in most parts of Asia that this is real, climate change is happening, that we need to think about it. Um, and I'm afraid that's not true of the country I live in. <laughs> that's not true of the country I live in at all, and it hasn't been since the 1980s. Uh, and so I think what you don't see is kind of denialism. And that might be a low bar, but I'm glad. <laughs> you know, I, I think that's a good place to begin. That that ne in neither India nor China do you see anything that looks like climate change denialism. And that is an enormous problem in this country, in the US. And I think the fact that it is such a big problem in the US is a problem for the world. So I, I'll, I'll probably end on that. Fantastic. I, I Thank you very much. I've really enjoyed talking to you. I hope we can continue this dialogue on another occasion. I'll pass over to Alan now, who I must also Alan. thank for organising this and bringing us all together. Thank you, Alan. What an extraordinary conversation. Thank you both so much. Really mind broadening and challenging. Thank you very, very much indeed.